I want to preach today, and, um, and, and I'm not going to read my scripture at the onset of this sermon today, but I want to invite you to do me a favor. Uh, today's sermon is a little bit different in nature, and, uh, and, uh, and I know that, that many of us are coming to the conversation. Maybe you saw the promotion online. Maybe you uh, didn't at all, and you're just coming to a regular service, but today, I want to preach from a thought called emotional ownership, the battle for peace in painful times. The battle for peace in painful times. Uh, and, and what I would like to do is I would like to invite you to close your eyes with me for a few moments. You know, often uh, at the beginning of sermons, I say a traditional prayer that, that has become norm for me. But I think today is going to open us up and unearth some conversations in us uh, that go beyond the norm. And I just want us to truly center ourselves and settle our hearts to be prepared for what God might say and do through us. So if you just close your eyes for a few moments. I just want you to intentionally to see yourself decluttering your mind, committing to being fully present, eliminating distractions, Maybe you put your phone on do not disturb, but your heart is still not on do not disturb. So the next few moments, let's just covenant together. Say, Lord, what we need more than anything for a time such as this is your voice and vision for our lives, our communities, and our world. Lord, it's my sincere prayer that you would open us create fertile ground in our hearts and minds today for what you might have to say and do. I pray right now that as we go through this sermon, Lord God, as emotions are unearthed, as questions are raised, that you would be the person sitting right next to us, that your person in the Holy Spirit would hold our hand, rub our shoulder, whisper in our ear, it's okay to not be okay. That we might find in your presence once again the peace, the courage, the hope, the joy we so desperately need. And now it is my prayer as it always is that as we go through these next moments, you not let anybody hear or see my voice or face, but let them hear and see only the voice and face of you that lives in me. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said together, amen, amen, amen. I want to share today from a very personal topic and one that I did not know up until about 10 days ago if we were going to go in this direction. But this idea of emotional ownership, the battle for peace in painful times. I don't know if you've known this, but the last 18 months have been a little crazy, been a little bit different. And if you would have told me that a global pandemic would take thousands of lives and disrupt the very idea of connection and community in our society as we knew it, I wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told me that Ahmaud Arbery would be hunted down on a morning run. Breonna Taylor would be shot and killed while sleeping in her own home. Rayshard Brooks would be shot in a Georgia parking lot while fleeing. That Jacob Blake would be shot while breaking up a fight in Kenosha, Washington. And that for eight minutes and 46 seconds, we would witness the breath leaving George Floyd's body. All revealing the deep state of racism and injustice and the cries for police reform and equity once again. I wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told me that we pour out our hearts, or at a minimum our thoughts, into the modern civil rights movement of our time, pulling down statues, marching in streets, some of us deciding consciously to put our lives at risk at a time where we didn't even know what a pandemic meant and yet said we still need to go and be 
where we need to be, I wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told me that we'd endure right after that one of the most volatile and morally bankrupt elections in our political history, filled with divisiveness and discord, I wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told me that we'd be arguing over voter access and security in Georgia, that we'd be arguing now over abortion rights in Texas, that we'd start arguing over vaccinations in public health, that we'd start arguing over if schools should be open or should be closed. That we'd start arguing over if we should wear a mask or not wear a mask. That we'd see the numbers surge again and that we thought something was coming to its end. And now, once again, it seems like we're back at square one. If you would have told me that 2,189 people as of Wednesday were going to die because of an earthquake in Haiti. If you would have told me that people were going to be bombed in Afghanistan, including 13 American soldiers who would lose their life. If you would have told me that Louisiana would once again be wrecked by landfall of Hurricane Ida. And that as of yesterday, 12 people would lose their life and thousands more without power. I wouldn't have believed you. If I could be personal for a second, if you would have told me that my daughter would start kindergarten and that nothing about her academic journey for the last several years would be normal. And that no matter how much we prayed and no matter how many meetings we had as a couple, we would not have the right answers about what to do that was best for our children. If you would have told me that the church that we've all loved and built from the ground up with pride would not be able to gather together for over a year, Challenging the very ideal of what we knew church to be traditionally. I wouldn't have believed you. If you would have told me that people we loved would be hospitalized, but we wouldn't be able to go and visit them. Or that one of my best friends would pass away and that I would have to do three funerals. Because all the people couldn't come to one, so I would have to relive the eulogy time and time again. I wouldn't believe you. And if I were to tell you 18 months ago that I would be struggling with my own anxieties and my own weights of feeling insecure in isolation because I have lived my entire life thriving off of public engagement, never having to sit with myself long enough to say, do I love being with me? I would have told you I didn't believe you. So here we are. And maybe you've never thought about all we've experienced since last March. Maybe you thought running that list, I could have done it shorter. But the truth of the matter is we need to wrestle with all of the realities that we've witnessed. Because hear my heart today, you are doing yourself a disservice to think that even if you haven't been involved in all of these issues, that you haven't felt all of them. That you haven't had to navigate them that you haven't had to endure them, that you haven't had to, for the last 18 months, figure out how to win the war of peace in your mind. And even for the strongest of us and the most put together of us, we've all been at war for peace in our mind. Cal Newport in his book, Deep Work, says, willpower is not an infinite resource that it will eventually give to the pressure around it. And all I came to let you know today is that it's okay to still not be okay. That it's okay to be tired. That it's okay to be frustrated. That it's okay to ask God the question, when will this be over? That it's okay to not have the answers and feel like you're just making the best decisions you know how. That it's okay to not be ready for what comes next. Personally, I am emotionally spent. And this series came, this sermon came about because I saw something in myself that I didn't like. To me, as I was sitting down one day and I saw 
the death toll reappear on national media. I don't know if you all noticed this, but it feels like it went away for a little bit. Then all of a sudden, it just popped back up on the screen. Once again, I was faced with this bar that was reminding me of the new cases and the new surges. And, and then I heard about Haiti, and then I heard about Lebanon, and then I heard about Afghanistan. And I saw something in myself that concerned me. I wasn't moved. I was numb. I saw in myself and I was shocked that I was not moved to emotion. And it used to be in church that we say things to people like, if you're trying to discern personal calling, what breaks your heart? Go towards that. But here's the question of our time. What do you do when all of it breaks your heart? What do you do when every time you turn on your TV, it breaks your heart? What do you do when every time you scroll down your timeline, it breaks your heart? What do you do when every time a friend shares something in their story, it breaks your heart? What do you do when everything you see and everything you're experiencing says, man, that's not okay? What do you do when what you feel is heartbreak day after day, month after month, year after year? I want to encourage you today with this big idea because here's the truth of the matter. I don't have all the answers today. won't pretend to, but here's what I have come to find. You cannot fix everything you feel. Now, I know in church, a lot of times the big idea is intended to provide hope and courage and, and action. But the action that I want you to take today is to give yourself grace. If you leave with no other action item, the action item of today is to look at yourself in the mirror and say, grace for you. Because you cannot fix everything you feel. And what happens in our society today, and this is what I believe the temptation is, is our feelings start to become the seeds to structure our life. And so instead of Scripture and the Spirit of God guiding our everyday decision-making, what happens is our feelings become the filter by which we make all of our decisions. And if we allow feelings to be the seed, then ultimately they also become the source of our fruit. And so when anxiety is our fruit, it's often because feelings were the seed. When stress is the only fruit we see, it's often it's because feelings were the first seed. When insecurity turns up as the fruit, it's often because feelings were the first seed. And here's how it works in our society. Can I show you how it works right now? Here's what concerns me. What concerns me about many of us is is we start with feelings. Can you put this on the screen? We start with feelings. And so what happens is we feel first. And because we feel first, we then fix our attention on our feelings. We fix our attention on the thing that's breaking our heart. And conceptually, that sounds good. Except for every week, I've had something else that I felt that draws my attention. And I feel like, I don't know if anybody's felt this tension. I'm just talking about me, preaching to myself, if I ain't preaching to nobody else. I feel like sometimes I'm leaving things undone. Like, I feel like I should be more involved in figuring out what's going on, masks versus masks, schools versus schools, vaccination versus vaccination. I mean, it seems like it would be the responsible thing as a parent to dive all of my attention and to fix all of my focus on trying to figure out what would be best. But, but the problem is I'm also heartbroken about refugees. And I'm also heartbroken about the fact that we scream for police reform and some of us haven't even went back to see what the updates on the trials have been. We were fixed for a moment, but then something else broke our heart. Something else took our feelings. And so now the thing that we march for, we don't even have the emotional capacity to see through. What happens is we feel and then our attention gets fixed on it. So then all of our focus and our energy and our posting and our 
sharing, all of it goes. And ultimately, it produces fruitfulness that may or may not be what God desires for our life. And here's why this gets dangerous, because if you look at Proverbs 29 and 11, I want you to see this. It's the New Living Translation. It says this, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. Can't make this public service announcement today. I'm going to make 30 of y'all mad, but I love you anyway. Your post is not where your power is. Your post is not where your power is. Your prayer is. Okay. All right. Excuse me. Your pillow talk is not where the power is. Your presence with hurting people is. Okay, here's the last one. Your paycheck and politics is not where the power is. But your ability to prophesy to dry bones is. And until the body of Christ starts to get back to the power of prayer, the power of presence, and the ability to prophesy over dry bones in our community, and prophesy over our children, and prophesy over our neighborhoods, and prophesy over our schools, and prophesy over ourselves, we are going to continue to see dry bones where God wants to bring back life. Because fools just vent their anger. But the wise know where to place their passion. I am looking for a generation of Christians who are equally as passionate on their prayer life as they are their posting life. I'm, I'm looking for a body of believers who know how to show up and be present with people even when they don't have answers. I'm looking for some folk who say, I'm going to vote because I know that there's power in policy. But, but I don't believe that policy is more powerful than what God can do when he moves through systems and infrastructure. In and, and, and all of this, our feelings are guiding us. I want you to see this scripture, Philippians 4 and 8. I want you to see this with me. Philippians 4 and 8 says this. He gives us some, Paul gives us some insight as to how to do this practically. Look at what he says. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. And what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Somebody say, think about it. He says, fix your thoughts and think about. Here in other words, he said, he says, stop inheriting your thoughts and choose them. <laughs> say it again. Paul essentially says, stop just inheriting thoughts and start choosing them. Because could it be? That one of the greatest tragedies of our culture today is that we have outsourced our emotions and feelings yes, yes. when God called us to own them. Yes. Could it be that we allow the timeline and national media and our friends' text messages and conversations at the wrong table to pull us out of emotional ownership day in and day out? And God is saying, no, 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 no. You were never intended to inherit. You were intended to create. Fix your thoughts. And so here's the model of Christ. The model of Christ is we start with fruit. See this? We should start with fruit. And then our fruit, fruit of the Spirit, our peace, our kindness, our joy, our long-suffering, that fruit should inform our focus, which ultimately should allow us to fix our thoughts on those things that are pure and honorable and trustworthy and righteous. So that, watch this, it doesn't mean that you won't feel, it just means that you're coming to your feelings with your fruit. So uh, my heart is broken, but thanks be unto God, I got the fruit of long suffering. I, I'm, I got a lot to be worried about, but I'm coming to it with the fruit of peace. I, I got a lot to cry about, but I'm coming to it with the fruit of joy. But if all of my feelings don't have fruit attached to it, I'm going to constantly be emotional mess when I should be emotionally in control. For a lot of us, our emotions are not being managed. They're managing us. And the enemy is having his way. Hear me. Because if you've never heard this term before, 
spiritual warfare is real. Hear me today. And the pain and problem that is weighing on my heart, and I believe probably yours, is that the tensions and the timelines and the challenges that we're facing today won't be resolved in just short order. That media and messaging influenced by agenda and interest won't give the answer. That opinions and options vying for our vote, vision, tap, shares, and likes will not be the solution that God is looking for. And we have to understand that we cannot fight a spiritual war with worldly weapons. I hope you hear me today. Some of you, you've been trying to figure out what's the missing piece. You've been trying to figure out, I just, I'm just in this cycle. I'm just inheriting whatever. I just, I feel like I'm all over the place. I was happy today. Then I stay. You cannot win a spiritual war with earthly, worldly weapons. Prove it to you in scripture so you don't think it's just my opinions. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Can I teach a little bit longer? Second, second, second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. Here's what it says in the King James. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That's, a, that's deliverance for some of y'all right there. You're not fighting people. Hear me. We ain't fighting a party. We're fighting a spirit that is pervasive in our society that we are trying to overcome, that we cannot win with worldly weapons. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So what do we have to do? Casting down imagination and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want you to hear me loud and clear today. There is a strong hold on our nation. There's a strong hold on our nation. Here's a temptation. Here's a temptation. I'm going to make three of y'all mad right here. Here's a temptation though because y'all gave me a good amen. But watch this. Watch this. There's a strong hold on our nation. But understand, a strong hold is a defensive structure. A strong hold is a defensive structure. It protects that which it already possess. Watch this. So here's what's crazy, real. A lot of us will be like, mm-hmm, we're going against strongholds. The problem is we keep thinking as a society of Christians that we somehow are protecting something. Could I suggest to you that the enemy already possesses some power? It just protecting it. And the temptation is for you and I to assume that we haven't already been captured. Here's the temptation. Most of us don't realize the enemy is protecting his control on us. So we around here singing songs. And we around here jumping and screaming. And he's like, but I can't get you to put your cell phone down long enough to talk to your kids. And I can't get you to put your cell phone down long enough to talk to your spouse. And I can't get you to put your cell phone down long enough to talk to me. And you out here thinking you got power. And all the enemy introduced was a resource to keep his stronghold over you. Let me make it practical for you. If you have a problem putting down your phone for longer than an hour, you may not be going against the stronghold. You may need somebody to help you break out. If, 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 if you got to see every statistic on CNN and Fox, and you get mad every time on Fox they say something you don't like, and it messes up your attitude for the whole day, and you can't be nice to nobody who you assume voted different than you, you don't even know. You mad because you assume. And the enemy's like, I got them. They won't talk to each other. I got them. They won't look at each other. I got them. They won't have a conversation. I got them. 
And we keep talking about strongholds, but strongholds are a defensive structure. It protects what it already possessed. So here's what I want to re- 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 or reiterate. Yes, the enemy has a stronghold in our country, but if we're not careful, we'll be a part of the ones captured. And we will think we have power because of the feelings that we had on Sunday that produced no fruit on Thursday. Even our churches have to be careful not to be held captive to the work of the enemy. Because we cannot win a spiritual war with worldly weapons. So here's three things I want to show you really quickly that I believe are critical to winning a spiritual battle. The battle for peace in a painful time. The scripture is very clear to us. The first thing that it says is casting down what? Imagination. I want, I want to walk through these points so you can understand where the battle begins and where it ends. So, so here's the first one. Imagination is where it often comes from. Have you ever noticed, Curtis, I was looking at this the other day, and the enemies greatest attack on great leaders that I saw in scripture didn't happen to their bodies, it happened to their minds. Have you ever noticed that when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, you mess me up, Pastor Josh, that the devil never attacks his body. He plants thoughts in his mind. So he introduces thoughts of pride. He introduces thoughts of insecurity. He introduces thoughts of of ambition. He never attacks Jesus' body. He attacks Jesus' imagination. He introduces thought. Because here's why. Imagination is a gift to the discipline. That's where vision comes from, dreams. Imagination is a gift to the discipline. But it's a trap to the weak. Watch this, watch this. I was with Jackson riding the other day, and I picked them both up from school. And, uh, and, and it's exciting because, you know, when you, you, I had a long day, and I was tired. I know no parent going to admit this, but there's sometimes you don't want to talk to your kids. I know y'all are going to tell, tell, tell the truth. Sometimes you don't want to talk to them. But they want to talk to you all the time. You know, like, they're like, Daddy, I had a great day. I'm like, oh, my God, where did all this energy come from? You ain't tired too? And so, so I picked the kids up from school, and Madison, Madison was obedient to the Spirit of the Lord. She knew daddy was tired. She fell right asleep. Boom. We got a 35-minute drive home. I don't feel like talking all the way home. And normally, Jackson is the one who don't be tired. He just be standing. I be asking him. I be like, you ain't tired? He be like, nope. On this particular occasion, I'm driving the kids home, and uh, Madison falls right asleep after school. But Jackson is up. But I noticed Something different. Pastor Lauren, Jackson wasn't talking to me. He was talking to himself. He was just a talking (laughs) and a talking. And his imagination was running wild. He begins, at one point, all I overheard was bubble gum is going to stick to the window. But then if we get in an accident, it's going to protect us because the bubble gum (laughs) is going to come around the whole car. I was like, what in the world? And like every wise parent who didn't feel like talking, I didn't dare interrupt him. Because he won't talk to me. The problem is, here's the problem, if anybody knows Jackson. Jackson has a problem turning his imagination off. So he runs with this thing and don't know when to stop. Some of you have known this about Jackson. He will, he'll be in character and he don't know when to cut the character off. And so there are times where he said some things to Ashley and I, and I'd be like, boy, have you lost your mind? He'd be like, I'm a bad guy. I'd be like, listen to me. <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> that alter ego better get it together real quick. I call that spirit out for the next 30 minutes. You can, that's for the ride home, not for right now. And Jackson just be in it. Very imaginative child. 
And I begin to think about, could it be that some of us don't have enough discipline in this season to carry imagination? Because we don't know how to cut it off as well. And could it be that the temptation that the enemy has loved to plant in our path is thoughts that allow our imagination to run wild? So watch this. So fears continue to amplify because we don't know how to cut our imagination off. Doubt is amplified because we don't know how to cut our imagination off. Right? Depression can't be overcome because we don't know how to cut our imagination off. And so what happens is these anxieties and these stressors and these insecurities continue to bubble to the surface because we keep thinking about what if and if this and if that. And can I encourage somebody today, the thing that I want you to take control over when you go home is your prayer life needs to say, I am casting down my imagination. Because imagination has robbed some of you of peace. You've been crying about stuff that didn't happen. You've been losing sleep over stuff that didn't happen. You've been arguing with people over stuff that didn't happen. Here it is. You've been cutting people off for stuff that might not have even happened. And you've been wrestling in yourself because we didn't learn to cast down imagination. And so the enemy said, I got them. Because they haven't learned yet that the battle starts their imagination weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God what did he say first thing we have to do is cast down imagination here's the second thing though because it spreads if we don't win the battle of imagination you know where it said it it's an infection and it spreads to an all too important place in our life our heart Proverbs 4 and 23 tells us what protect our heart above all else for out of it flows the what so all this fruit we've been talking about, all these issues we've been talking about, it flows from the heart. And can I just announce to you today, you are not in con- as in control of your heart as you think you are. You're not. Listen to me. I'm not. Pray every morning. Still got to look at my heart sometimes and be like, what in the world is going on in there? I'll prove it to you in Scripture. Jeremiah 17. Really quick, Jeremiah 17. Hear me? Jeremiah 17. 10 through 11. Here's what it says in the New Living Translation. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. And it's wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. Secret motives. And I give all people rewards according to their actions they deserve. I want to read this from the Message Translation really quick. Here it is. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. And I get to the heart of the human and to the root of the things. I treat them as they really are. God is trying to get to the root of some of your challenges in your heart. And what we have to do is win the battle of imagination so that this doesn't become an infection, so that we don't carry this, watch this, into other generations. So that we don't carry these fears and anxieties into other generations. And maybe you're saying, well, I don't have children. No, 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 you are spreading it to a generation at your job. You're spreading it to a generation in your neighborhood. There are people watching your example and looking at your life, and we are called to be light bearers of what could be. But here's here's what I want to say. Here's where it's defeated. Can I tell you where it's defeated? Incarceration. (laughs) Second Corinthians chapter 10 and 5. Here it is. Here it is. Casting down imaginations. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity. Every thought. Somebody say every thought. Bring into captivity what? Every thought. Now, here's what I've learned. Coming to church, it's very easy to say things like take into captivity a thought, but then we don't leave a practical application sometimes. So if you're taking notes today, and I pray you are, I want you to write down these three things that you can do to take captive your thoughts. Because the goal of this sermon is emotional ownership. You can never own your emotions the way God has designed for you to if you don't learn how to take captive your thoughts. Now, when I say these, I want, before I even say them, I want you to resist the temptation to cancel yourself out of them before you've even tried them. Because for some of you, here's what the enemy's going to do. This is how he keeps us in the stronghold. This is how he protects what he already possesses. I'm going to say you can do something, and then immediately you're going to be like, we can't do that, though. 
Watch this. Your schedule is going to pop up and tell you that. I don't got the capacity for that. The excuses are going to rush your mind before the hope does. And they're so practical, yet they're so biblical and have the power to change your life. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Number one. Number one. How do we take captive our thoughts? Number one. Start every day seeking God's heart. Because here's what happens in our world. We allow what we feel from the world to inform our day first. And then all of our prayer life is, is a reaction to a deficit. It's like a diet. People always ask me, why do I work out so early in the morning? Because it's conviction for the rest of the day. I'm like, man, I done worked out too hard this morning to mess around and eat bad the rest of the day. I tried the whole working out in the afternoon, evening thing. That just means I ate bad all day. And all I was trying to do was break even at the end of the day. <laughs> some of y'all like, some of y'all like, I work out this hard so I can eat what I want. I ain't trying to get better. I'm just trying to survive. I ain't trying to get abs. I'm just trying not to lose. <laughs> and the enemy has allowed us to, to operate at a deficit every day. So you start your day in the negative. You, you, you wake up, you grab your phone, and you look at what's on your timeline. You turn on your TV and you look at what's on the news. You check your text message and you look at the stress your friend got. And then we look up and say, man, I am not walking in joy. I'm not walking in peace. I'm not walking in hope. It's because we didn't start our day with the fruit of the Spirit. We tried to end our day with it. Take captive those thoughts. By starting every day seeking God's heart. As a church, we want to help you to do that. So in a couple of weeks, starting on September 19th, we step into our fast. We've been in 40 days of fasting and prayer this year. And we broke it up into 10 days of prayer and fasting four times. And so this is our third installment of prayer and fasting. And we will start on the 19th of September. I want you to, two weeks out, I want you to plan to be a part of this time of starting your day. One of the action items of this time of prayer and fasting these 10 days is we're going to try to start every day with prayer. We're not going to let the world tell us how to feel first. We're not going to let people tell us how to feel first. We're going to say, Lord, guide my heart. Lord, I am seeking you first. And we're going to be having prayer here every morning at 6 a.m. Yeah, some, see, I had no, that's why I had to get out of disclaimer because some of y'all immediately was like, six. Six, bro. And I just want you to be careful because if the first thought you have is I can't do six, but I can do Netflix all night. I can't do six, but I can do Hulu. I can't do six, but I can post on my stories and share and look and like. I, I can't do six, but I've investigated my friend's new boo, and I done found out who his ex-boo was, and I done found out. Every Some of y'all got time to do stuff then you got time to go to sleep so that you may wake up and start your day seeking God's heart, taking captive the thoughts that the enemy will use to destroy our lives. Here's the second one. Second one. I want you to start speaking to the thoughts that the enemy has planted in your life by name. This is important. Speak to the thought by name. No ambiguity. I don't want you this much just being like, you know, the Lord, it's a lot going on. What's the lot? Tell me what a lot is. Speak to that thing by name. Do you know why the enemy has been able to have a playground in some of our minds? It's because we keep thinking we are taking them out of the house. We keep thinking we're kicking them out. And he said, you ain't even spoke to the real issue yet. That's why in Jeremiah, he says, the Lord examines the heart to speak to the what? The root. But until you identify the root, you can't speak to that thing by name. I'll tell you a quick story, quick story. I, uh, I'm a third, if you didn't know, I'm a third. And so my grandfather, Vernon Lee Gordon Sr., uh, my father, of course, Vernon Lee Gordon Jr., I'm Vernon Lee Gordon III. And, uh, and in our family, if you would have showed up, this happened many times before, Ashley can testify to this. If you show up to a family function, you can't just show up and say, Vernon. Because the first question my aunts and cousins are going to ask you is, which one? Who are you talking to? 
Who are you looking for? And so my grandmama, my grandmama helped distinguish all this for us. My grandmama called my granddaddy Cap or Vern Lee. Everybody know if you're looking for granddaddy, it's Cap or Vern Lee. If you're looking for my daddy, he go by boo. Go by boo. I'm going to expose myself right here. I'm going to try to be posting this out on the World Wide Web. If you're looking for me, you ain't looking for Vernon. You're looking for Boopy. And if you come into the home or the context of the community and you don't know about which name to call it out, you won't get the attention of what you're trying to really connect with. Can I talk to 30 people today? The enemy has had a playground in your mind because you thought you were talking about your daddy. No, you're talking about the root of anxiety. You're talking about the root of insecurity. You're talking about the root of a fear of failure. And you need to start speaking to the thoughts that have held you captive by name. What is that thing that the enemy has planted years ago in my childhood that I've been walking around just saying, Lord, do a work. No, do what work? What do you want to call out? That's why. When Jesus talked to the demon-possessed man, he called that demon by name. He had to call it out because there was something else that he needed to pray. God says it's time for you to stop praying ambiguous prayers. It's time for you to stop just casually hoping the songs that you sing will solve the problem. What is that thing that you've been afraid to name? The marriage issue is really an insecurity issue. Call it by name. The friendship issue is really a trust issue. Call it by name. The lack of moving on what God has called you to do and having vision for is a faith issue. Call it by name. And until you start calling those thoughts by name, they will live rent-free in your mind. Call it by name. That's how you take that captain. And I, if I would go a step further, publicize, I would speak to the thought every single day. Fear, you have gripped me for too long, but not this year. Bitterness, you've had me long enough, not this year. Hopelessness, you've had me long enough, not this year. I'm taking captive that thought. And I'm submitting it to the altar of God. Here's the last thing. We want to take captive our thoughts. We got to start every day seeking God's heart. We got to speak to the thought by name. And we got to stay in community with healthy people. There's a strategic adjective there. Don't miss it. Help me, all my grammar people. Stay in community with what? Healthy people. Healthy people. I'm not saying you're not called to evangelize to some friends who need to be restored and redeemed. But where are your healthy people at? That's the question I want you to ask yourself. Where are my healthy people? Where are my healthy people at? I know I'm lifting up my friend's arm, but where are my healthy people at? I know I'm interceding for my friend. Where are my healthy people at? Because I need a place where I can be lifted up as well. I need a place where I can be accountable to these thoughts that are ruling my life. I need a place where I can be vulnerable. I need a place where I don't got to be perfect. Can I tell y'all something? Can I be transparent? I got a place. I got pastors I get around, play golf with, and I can't beat none, none of them. Lose every time. But it's a place where I can say, man, I am confused. Where I can say, man, I feel like I'm doing the best I can, and I don't even know if it's enough. I got a place. And so when we talk about life groups here at this church, we're not talking about them out of cliche or casuality. And yes, hear my heart, we have to create spaces for us to grow spiritually deeper. But hear my heart, growing spiritually deep is not an excuse to not also be emotionally healthy. You need both there, not either or. And so hear my heart today. God does not want you to do life alone. God does not want your marriage to show up to church each and every week and you act like you good when you know y'all ain't slept in the same room, y'all ain't talking, y'all mad. God wants you to find a place where you can heal 
and find hope. God doesn't want you to keep coming to church and you're single and you're saying, I'm trying to figure out my vocational life and I'm trying to figure out how to honor God with my life right now and in my stewardship. I'm trying to figure out who are the right friendships around me. I'm trying to discern what the next season of my life looks like. And you just act like you're good because you sung the song. No, God wants you in healthy community. So lead a group. Join a group. But don't do life alone. Emotional ownership requires us to take captive every thought that seeks to exalt itself above God. So do me a favor. I want you to close your eyes for a few moments. I just want to pray for us in these last moments we have that God would give us the strength and the courage. Whew to take emotional ownership over our life. And I'm going to just make a bold invitation really quick. If you're somebody in this room, nobody's judging you, nobody's shaming you, but if you say, I just want to take a physical step to affirm the shift that's about to happen in my life, that my emotions have been all over the place that I haven't taken ownership of them I've just been inheriting them but today I take control back of my thoughts if that's you I just want you to come to the altar I'm not gonna ask you to say anything I'm not gonna ask you to do anything we're just gonna pray corporately but you say I'm here to take captive my thoughts my thoughts have been ruling my life but today I'm taking ownership of my thoughts I'm taking ownership of my thoughts I'm taking ownership of my emotions I'm taking ownership of every single thing that the enemy has placed a stronghold in my life about and I'm claiming victory and I'm claiming freedom this is your space I just want you to come as a physical declaration of a shift happening in your life a physical declaration of a shift happening in your life a physical declaration of a shift happening in your life a physical declaration of a shift happening in your life thank you Holy Spirit thank you Holy Spirit Father right now you've seen these steps of your people a step in the physical but much more in the spiritual. It is a testament to a change that is taking root in their life. Right now, Lord God, we declare the spirit of freedom over them right now in the blood of Jesus. We declare that they will be free in their mind. We declare that they will be free in their mind. We declare that every thought that the enemy has planted for decades Lord God, they're going to begin to take captive of. Lord God, that you're going to bring it into clarity. That they're going to be able to seize it at the root. That they're going to be able to call it out by name and eradicate it from their home. Eradicate it from their heart. Eradicate it from their conversations. Eradicate it. They will never speak down on themselves again in this season. But Lord God, they will declare that they are a child of God. That there's more for them. We declare right now that the infection of insecurity, we are stopping the spread right now. The infection of fear and doubt, we're stopping the spread right now. The infection of anxiety, we're stopping the spread right now. Casting down imagination, we declare that they belong to you. Lord God, that they will walk more boldly than they ever have before. We speak confidence over their life right now. We speak courage over their life right now. We speak hope and faith and strength ownership that they are being delivered from the stronghold by the blood of Jesus by the blood of Jesus by the blood of Jesus I pray right now Lord God that as they have sat in this moment as they, they've heard your word over their lives I pray that that word would take deep root that it will not be washed away or scorched or plucked up as scripture talks about but that it would take deep root and that their feelings will no longer be their guide, but their fruit will. God, we bring fruit to our feelings. And we declare that the power of God is able to bring us through to the other side. 
So God, we stand in agreement with them now. We stand in expectation for their future. And we stand in expectation for their freedom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody declare all over this room, amen, amen, and amen. Would you give God a big hand clap of praise as we celebrate every person? Come on, I dare you to celebrate freedom, celebrate victory.